Hello and uh, welcome to this week's edition of uh, Politics Today in what has been an extraordinary week in British politics. Uh, first of all, we have a new Prime Minister in this trust, then followed by the death of our beloved monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, and a new king. And we have the eyes of the world uh, focused on our nation at this time as we're in a time of mourning uh, for Her Majesty the Queen. So joining me in today's programme, I'm joined by Olave Snelling from the Christian Broadcasting Council, uh, together with uh, David Hughes, uh, Prayer for Parliament. Uh, Olave, it's a, a pleasure to have you back on Politics Day, and I can't think of anyone better uh, to be on this programme as we look back on the Queen's incredible reign of over seven decades and also look to the future of what life will be like under King Charles III. Um, so firstly, what are your thoughts on the passing of our beloved monarch and this period of mourning that we're going through where I think God has been centre stage through all our traditions linked to the royal family. Um, and it's certainly, uh, our nation is, is without doubt in real mourning over the loss of a beloved queen. We are living through unprecedented times. The loss of beloved Queen Elizabeth II is and has had a seismic effect upon the whole world. I mean, it's, just, it's a global reaction to the death of a much loved person, but a most fantastic person, formidable, formidable person, wonderful person, a woman of deep faith, a woman of courage, you know, of steadfastness and, and a huge sense of duty, which she has carried out for you know, 70 years. I mean, this is an astonishing record. And so when she died, I think if, if, if I reacted in the same way that a lot of other people did, it was a, a sense just absolutely knocked back, a sense of personal shock and personal loss. I have never actually met Her Majesty, but I know many people, and I might t say something about that a little later on. One of um, our great friends was a lady-in-waiting to the Queen, and this is something that has, I've always treasured in, in getting a tiny little glimpse into the everyday workings of, of that incredible family. So it's with a most profound sense of loss that we meet today. And we're looking forward to the time um, when her funeral takes place and, and then ultimately to the coronation of King Charles III. And I think that the, you know, the whole world has, is, is, is on tenterhooks and watching every single thing that's going on in our nation. Never before has there been such a focus on our nation and, and what it stands for. And she actually embodied that, which is the most incredible thing. Absolutely. Uh, and David, it's great to have, have you on the programme. And, and before the programme was aired, uh, you were sharing how you were, you were seven at the Queen's, um, I'm sorry, I'm giving your age away now, <laughs> of the coronation uh, back in 1953. Um, but for, for my generation, we know nothing other than the Queen. Um, she's always been there. She's always been our monarch. Is something that uh, we, we've always thought about. But to actually rule over our nation for you know, seven decades. We just celebrated her platinum jubilee uh, back in the summer, and so pleased we did. Um, you know, what, what, what does the, the Queen mean to you? Uh, and also the fact that, that she's been a source of stability uh, and integrity for our nation, I think it's extraordinary. Yes, um, <clears throat> well, she's always been there, and she's always been there when we needed her. Um, and in particular, I remember when um, Diana died, the Queen, you know, we were all, everybody was calling out for her because, you know, we wanted her down here in Buckingham Palace. And when she did go on the, on the television and gave her thoughts, it, it, it sort of it, it was a relief to the nation. And so whenever the Queen has been around, um, we've expected her to do what she does. She's also, I know through all the most recent, certainly the last five or six Christmas um, 
uh, speeches she's given, she's always promoted her faith with Jesus Christ at the centre, which has been a, a real uplifting for, for Christians to know that she has stood for what we stand for. And I must admit that the last time uh, on the Tuesday when we were watching um, Liz Truss go and receive um, her premiership from uh, the Prime Minister from the Queen, I thought the F Queen looked so happy to meet Liz Trust, and I thought she's going to be able to give the wisdom because we weren't expecting what was going to happen two days later. Um, and then suddenly, a seism it, it was like a seismic blast, sort of what happened on Thursday two days later, um, a shock to the system, a shock for the nation. Um, yeah, we've lost a wonderful matriarch, mother, queen, grandmother, everything the people wanted. I uh, she will be missed. Uh, and Ole, Ole, it's extraordinary, isn't it? When we, when we see the scenes, um, particularly as, as we've seen over the last few days up in Scotland, um, the number of uh, Scots going out to say to give their respects to the Queen all along the roadside as we've seen that um, um, you know convoy with with her in in, in the cars on, on the way to Edinburgh was absolutely extraordinary we've seen tractors lining up we've seen uh, uh, horse riders with their horses lining up to pay tribute now now the one thing I think uh, if we take this a bit deeper and look into the spiritual aspect of this that um, I think the nation is uh, is obviously mourning the death of our Queen, but I think it goes deeper as well. And I think what the nation is also touching upon is the loss of our Judeo-Christian heritage. The fact that the Queen came from a different era with different values, the honoured um, uh, duty and a sense of call to the nation, that, that she was humble in character, even though that, that she was the Queen. Um, and it was that kind of godliness that she brought to her role uh, as monarch. And we know that the scripture says that righteousness exalts a nation. Yeah. Uh, and we can see that with her being queen, um, there was something that we still had that hope that there, there could be a turning back to the Lord in, in, in our nation. So do you think that with this big outpouring of grief uh, for the queen, that it's giving the British people time to reflect on what we have and what we've lost, and maybe a sense in their hearts that we need to turn back to the same values that the Queen had uh, and, and demonstrated through her long reign of over 70 years. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it has been incredible to see these people turning up at four o'clock in the morning, whatever, going, going into St. Charles Cathedral, uh, and queuing up and queuing up, and, and they, they will be, when, they, when the body comes down here, to London, now it's going to be, uh, you know, I, I think that nobody has any idea of what we're going to see. I mean, an, an incredible outpouring of grief. And what is interesting about it is that she did everything with such impeccable wisdom and fine, fineness. She was a fine person and a godly person. And it's only now in her death that we begin to feel the full impact of that death spiritually, that she swore in her coronation oath to uphold that wisdom from God, holding the, the, the orb in her hand and the scepter, to uphold the Christian faith. And she has done that with incredible incredible the strength and dignity so it's not a kind of a showy thing but it's a really really deep felt sentiment she was a true believer as a few people I know who knew her personally will testify to that it was a, a real faith a deep faith and one which she wasn't ashamed at all to speak about and so in her death, we feel bereft. And I think that it, does, it is a shock to a nation and to a world that has become increasingly hedonistic and materialistic to suddenly be confronted with the issues of eternity. 
you know, the issues of what it really means to be a believer in, in Christ. And so it's been a most poignant, incredible time and will continue to be until her funeral. And all I can say with the most profound sense of gratitude is you know, God save the Queen and God now save the King. That this is something that is rooted right in the, in the center of, of, our, of our nation's life. Absolutely. It's wonderful. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And I think it will come increasingly more and more into focus. And, uh, and David, I mean, maybe it's the last act the Queen did was to actually save the Union. Uh, and what I mean by that, the fact that she spent her, her last days in Balmoral Castle up, here, up near Aberdeen uh, in, in the north of Scotland, where she felt safe, she felt she could switch off from the rest of the world. Um, also gave something back to the Scottish people as well. And I think what has been so extraordinary is the connection that the Scots have with our monarch uh, and how the, in this last act, by having her, uh, by dying in Balmoral, then we wouldn't have had the, the parades that we've had up in Scotland. None of that would have happened. So the fact is that she did that to remind the Scottish people uh, obviously going through a great battle now and I'm not going into politics about uh, the Union or whether Scotland should be an independent nation but what it's done though is, is linked hasn't it the Scottish people with the monarchy um, and uh, which, which is very important because you know as, as a nation uh, we are stronger together than we are individually whether it's an independent Scotland, independent Wales or an independent Northern Ireland this is better for the UK that we are we are a union. Uh, I know that some of our viewers will probably disagree with that, particularly those up in Scotland. But but this is very very important. So w what do you think the impact will be of, of of the Queen actually dying in Balmoral and and seeing the Scottish people pour out their kind of grief and their respects to her because they loved her deeply. I mean, she was half Scottish, her mother was Scottish, so there's huge Scottish connections between her and the uh, Scottish people. I, th I think it's going to strengthen the, uh, the monarchy in Scotland, uh, as you said. If she had died down in Buckingham Palace or Windsor Castle, uh, she wouldn't have been flown up to uh, Scotland. Uh, she always said she loved Balmoral. It was her home. It was her favourite place. And to see the Scots taking her under their wing in the latter, last couple of days or a few days up there, um, I hadn't realised also that there was a separate crown. She had a cr has a crown uh, for, as in Scotland, which is different from the crown in England. Um, and I was very moved by the outpouring of love for the Scots. Um, and they're standing for, for Great Britain. Um, you know, the, it was as if the Union Jack would be there. But it's, they are pouring out their love and their emotions. And then I was also moved when Charles, um, King Charles, was there uh, taking his allegiance of standing while the body was in laying in state, and then going and talking to specifically the young people around and the invalid people. And I thought that's a different Prince Charles than we've seen in the past. And you know, his first outpouring of love as a king was to the Scottish people, and that was quite moving. Absolutely. Uh, what would you say the, uh, the legacy of, of Queen uh, Elizabeth is to our nation? I mean, she brought incredible strength, she brought stability, uh, she brought peace to the realm, and we know that she could only have done that in a relationship with, with the God Almighty and respecting him on honouring him. So the fact that the Lord honoured her is extraordinary with the, with the rainbows that are over, mm. over kind of Buckingham Palace and over mm. Windsor Castle, mm. uh, and also the parade uh, through Edinburgh, uh, uh, a light of shaft. So we know that the Lord is happy with her, but also it's a reminder of, uh, to our nation again of what we lost. And, and do you think now is the time to really pray uh, that people's hearts are open now to the gospel because this is the values that our Queen represented, uh, our Christian values, and she represented our Judeo-Christian heritage. Totally. In a world that is so 
concentrated on the whole on material wealth and everything that is outward. What she represented was a, a soul, a heart, totally given to God and to serve him. And I love those phrases that have come through. Various people have texted about that, that she said, oh, that she would love the Lord Jesus to come back soon. Mm. And when they said, why? And she said, so that I could cast my crown at his feet. That's a very, a very powerful thing to have said and indicates exactly what she felt. Mm -hmm. And so in a nation which has become more materialistic and hedonistic, I think that this is a kind of a jolt to the system. This is something which brings us all up short, makes us think in terms of eternity because we are confronted with the reality of the Queen's death and there is her body lying in state and it's just so poignant. And so I think that if anything can actually shock our nation um, into a reappraisal of where we are as a nation and what our fundamental values are and where our heart lies, it is the death of the Queen. Absolutely. Rather oh, like the death of Diana, because when Diana died, mm -hmm. the nation was in complete shock. And, it, and, and it's going to be a similar thing over this coming week. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and David, um, we, we now know that we have a, a new king and uh, King Charles III. So what do you think we can expect under King Charles? Um, knowing that those who bore his name before haven't done particularly well. Uh, we only have to look back at history as a kind of warning. But it's also a reminder that we can have uh, good kings, we can have good queens, we can have bad kings, and we can have bad uh, queens, but we haven't had many queens um, over us, but we've had more kings and queens. But, you know, we, we, our nation is very much at a crossroads now. Uh, we are a crossroads spiritually, and as a king, he has a choice of following in the queen's footsteps, um, by being sincere and following her faith and accepting Jesus Christ into his life uh, as his Lord and Saviour, or he can go the globalist route uh, and the liberal route uh, and become defender of the, uh, the, the faith rather than defender of the faith uh, and open the nation up to more multiculturalism, um, more one world religion services and stuff as well. So we are, we are really at a crossroads, aren't we? I think, uh, I think he's changed a lot. If, if, if this had been happening after, um, for example, when Diana died, if, if the Queen had been moving on at that stage, I, don't th I think a lot of people felt that he wasn't going to be a very good king. But he's showing himself now to be totally different. And at the age of 72, when most people are retiring, he's starting his, the job he was destined for. And I think just watching and seeing what was going on, getting out of the car, shaking hand with people, laughing and smiling, um, I really genuinely believe that he has learnt a lot from his mother. Um, she's also obviously been training William, but Charles has got his opportunity to have a few years. Uh, obviously he won't live as long as the Queen, but, um, but he is... I believe, different today than he was, and I think he'll actually make a good king. What was good is that there was a lot of thought that he was, going, you know, when he was younger, I'm going to be the defender of the faiths. Um, <clears throat> on the, I had heard in, recently that uh, he had, someone said he had checked it out and he understood and now understood he has to be the defender of the faith. So when the other day he actually said, defender of the faith. I believe he's learning, I think he's learning an awful lot of wisdom and discernment at this stage and I think he'll be a, a good king for however long he's got but as you already said the King Charles's didn't live long reigns in the past. Mm. But, uh, and, and, and Olive, I, I mean really uh, King Charles needs to capitalise on what his uh, mother's left behind, which is an incredible legacy of incredible goodwill, um, particularly when it comes to the Union and particularly comes to the Commonwealth. I think his first job as King will be to secure the Union. And I think this is also why he's decided to do a tour 
uh, around the British Isles to secure the Union. I, I think, you know, I think uh, what having the Queen's possession go through uh, Scotland, through Edinburgh and lying in state in Edinburgh as well was, was very uh, symbolic and very, very important. Um, but this is essential, isn't it? If, if, if we're going to keep our nation together, uh, then he's got to play his role in knitting our nation together with all the conflicting political views and ideologies. And, and that's probably what has made the Queen um, so loved and so well respected because you never knew what her political opinion was. So I think Charles would do very well to follow in those footsteps because we know that once you start, and even in this programme, uh, we can bring division into the programme by, by talking about the Union when, when we see there are nationalists in Wales and Scotland, Northern Ireland who want independence. So even within our own uh, United Kingdom, there's demands for independence uh, and with the Commonwealth as well. So how do you think the best way he can go about securing um, the, uh, the Union for, for at least another generation? drawing closer to God, that the whole development of his personal faith from wherever he is now, uh, this is going to expand into the future where he takes up that in incredible role uh, as king. One of the things that struck me tremendously was that when he gave the speech to both houses of parliament in Westminster Palace, he was a few steps above where Charles I stood at his trial. There's a plaque in the stone, as, as we all know, um, commemorating that fateful day uh, when he was condemned to death and then taken out and executed. And I bet you that Charles didn't miss the thing, that, that there, was, there was something incredibly poignant about that. So when you get uh, republicanism coming in, um, it, it, it is something which cuts a swathe right through the heart of the whole country, the heart of government, the heart of everything. So it's not that you have to be necessarily to be a dyed-in-the-wool monarchist, but to love the Queen, to love the King, to honour them, to follow them, to pray for them. And what we have as, as, as uh, the King's loyal subjects is to pray for him daily, to pray that the Lord will sustain him, undergird him, strengthen him, lift him up, given him all the wisdom from above. Now there's lovely verses uh, in the scriptures about wisdom which is from above, which is peaceable. It's so different to, to worldly wisdom. And to pray for that for him, that he will carry out his reign, however short or long that might be, with God at the very center and his, and his devotion to Jesus Christ right at the very core of what he does every single day of his life. Absolutely, and it's great within our national anthem, we, we've got to God save the king. So everyone kind of proclaiming that as well. Um, we will pray that that has, has a big impact. We're down to the last uh, few minutes of, of, of the programme, David. Now, I am aware that on Friday, the 16th of, of September, there is a day of prayer for our nation. Um, I think we need it more than ever now, don't we, to pray for our new Prime Minister, Liz Truss, and also then to pray for our new monarch, King, King Charles III. Uh, how important is it as Christians that we dedicate time to pray for Britain in our unique circumstances that we find ourselves in, because we are truly living in a new era. As a team in Parliament, we've been praying for and, and praying that the nation would call a national day of prayer. We, this has been doing for years, quite a few years, but little did we realise it was going to take the Queen dying to be able to get a national day of prayer. But King George VI during the war was always calling for national days of prayer. And the, and the prayer does have, a, a, it, it, it has an amazing effect on, on things. Um, certainly in the war, it affected things to our benefit. And I believe this nation does need, I mean, there's a spiritual war going on as opposed to a natural war. So the, to pray on this Friday, this nation needs it. They need it because of the, the situation the people are in, the situation the politicians are in. We've got to literally stand, and as, as Christians, we have to literally stand in the gap and pray our hearts that, the, that God will literally turn this nation back 
to him and that would be miracle upon miracle. The church needs to also wake up. I mean, there's a, you know, there's a lot of things that, of gifts of the spirit that can be done. I know there are a lot of prophetic words around, but I don't think people realize what's around the corner of what God's got planned to shake this nation, to wake it up. We need it. And you've talked a lot about materialism, Olive. Um, with what's going on in the cost of living and everything, I think God is working on the basis to take away the, the materialistic aspect where we've got to go on our knees, repent and call out for help. Absolutely. And Olive, we're down to two minutes of the programme list. Uh, and as a powerful intercessor, how would you advise our, our viewers to pray? Because we are in a truly new era, a, a new monarch in uh, King Charles III, also a new prime minister in Liz Truss and a new cabinet. It, it's, uh, it, it's a new beginning, but also falls very close to the, uh, the new Jewish year as well. And I think this is highly significant. I would say straight away, that there are people who say, I don't know how to pray. And the answer to that is everybody, every single person on this earth can pray, in this nation can pray. Maybe it's not something that you're used to doing, but you can start. You can just wherever you are, walking in the garden or sitting at home or wherever you are, you can turn your heart towards God. And in whatever way you like, I'm quite sure that God doesn't mind at all in what posture you pray or how you pray, but just say those words and bless the new King Charles, bless the memory of Queen Elizabeth II, bless the ministers of state and of parliament. And we pray, we continue to pray, and we urge all of us here on this program, urge everybody in whatever way you want to do it, please, just pray, lift your heart towards God, and he will hear you, because he has promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us, even in the midst of such incredible turbulence. Amen, Olive. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Olive, and also David, for joining us on uh, this week's Politics Today. I want to thank you uh, for watching this program as we mark the the death of our beloved monarch, uh, Queen Elizabeth II, and how we have a new king in King Charles III. Uh, it is our prayer that uh, God would touch our king, um, that he would be saved, and he'd lead our nation in righteousness. So we want to thank you for watching this week's Politics Today. Mm -hmm.